Don't you kind of want to say, why on earth are we looking at this passage? What were you thinking, Pastor Jen? I agree, that passage makes me nauseous. It's devastating. But we're looking at the life of Abraham, and he has in his life story difficult and devastating parts. We have in our life story difficult and devastating parts. And so we can't look at life and just skip over the hard parts, not ours and not his. So this is one of his hard parts, and it's a doozy. So before we reflect on this passage, let us pray. Holy God, we come to lay our lives before your holy scripture that we may find the grace that lies waiting there for the things we don't understand, for the sacrifices we required, we remember that you provide. And all God's children said, amen. You know, there are some passages of Scripture that we lay claim to, like holding on to handles that lead us through the dark. One is, quote, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's one we hold on to in tough times. Or I have come to give you hope and a future, says Scripture. That's one we clutch on to when the future is murky. And of course, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We will cross-stitch that one, tattoo that, that one, put it on a billboard sign, trying to claim God's love. But then there are passages like this one, ones that we don't claim but lay claim to us. It's like a pet owner who, who gets a cat and learns that the cat actually owns them. It's like that new dad who the first time that baby girl wraps her hand around his finger learns that the daughter has him. This passage is that. Sometimes we go to read the Bible and the Bible reads us. Sometimes we go to claim the Bible and it claims us in ways that are challenging and surprising and maybe even wise and good and important. But before we can get to that, we got to get through the hard stuff of this passage. Catherine Schiffdecker explains there's this Yiddish folktale that goes something like this. Why didn't God send an angel to Abraham to to tell him to sacrifice his son Isaac? The tale says because God knew no angel would take on such a task. Instead, the angel said, if you want to command death, do it yourself. This story tells of a God who asks Abraham to sacrifice his son. Christians call it the sacrifice of Isaac. Jewish tradition is the Akedah, or the binding of Isaac. It is a story that has engendered heated debate for centuries. And over the years, we've either decided to deal with it or not deal with its difficulty. Well-meaning people have reduced this story by leaping over its horror and skipping to this simple lesson of faith. Some just negate the story. They simply throw it out like baby in bathwater. And historically, some have used this in dangerous ways, justifying sacrifice of children or justifying uh, violent acts through God. So what do you do with this story? Is it a story of abusive God? Is it a story of misguided Abraham? Is it the story of religious violence? Is it a story of faith and obedience? This story is foundational to Judeo-Christian history and has rippling, far-reaching effects that are too many to go into in a short message, but this story does lay claim to us, no matter how you wrestle with it, it boldly, aggressively, hauntingly, vividly imprints this one truth, the one reality, the actuality, that all that we have, even our own lives and the lives of those dear to us, belong to God. The scripture lays claim to us that all that we have and all that we are belong to God, and yet, and still, there's an assurance in the middle of it. 
Notice the story opens this way. God says, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. Now, whenever the Bible gives a specific place, we pay attention. The location is called Mount Moriah. It's associated with the Temple Mount. It's 35 acres, and this is where Abraham goes to offer his son Isaac. It's also the place where King David uh, is the site of the windy threshing floor that David bought from the Jebusites to build the first temple of God that would welcome God's presence among them. And then Solomon builds that temple, lasts for 400 years until the Babylonians crush it, and then they build it again on that site. But get this. This is also the place where there's the platform that Jesus was presented as a baby, a son offered to God. Sound familiar? This is the place where Jesus worshiped God and was left behind at Passover as a boy. This is the place where he flipped the money changers table and castigated the hypocrisy of religious leaders. This is the place where he said, I'm the Messiah. I'm the Savior. This is the place where Abraham goes to offer his son. His son, Isaac, the one Abraham and Sarah prayed for, wept for, begged for, pleaded for, wanted, the son that God promised, the heir, the son through whom God's promises of descendants are supposed to come, and now he's the one who's supposed to be sacrificed, this one beloved, chosen son, And as they approach, Isaac says, we're heading there for a sacrifice, but we don't have a lamb to sacrifice. And Abraham says, God will provide. So to this day, this mountain, this place is called the Lord will provide. On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. That Hebrew word ra'ah is, is literally translated both for provide and seeing. So it's translated on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. On the mount of the Lord he shall be seen. So what then? Did God see and provide for Abraham in this excruciating time of need and call? That's the question for you. What does God provide in your times of excruciating need and call? I just want to give three ideas to that, short ideas. First, before the sacrifice could happen, did you notice God stopped it? God provided a ram and tied it to a tree. An animal sacrifice of a ram then became a tradition throughout the scripture. Especially a ram. God gave them a way to come before God, gave them something they could offer, gave them a way to be part of God's purpose, God's promise, God's plan, a way to glorify his name. They gave, God gave them something to offer. I, I went to lunch with someone new to me this week, and he said, you know, my faith is important to me. But I'm scared that God is going to ask me to offer something, and I'm going to miss it. Or it's going to be something I don't want to give, and I'm not willing to give. And I thought, how many times have I felt that? How many times have I heard that as a pastor? Abraham was willing to give it, but he didn't have to because God provided something he could give that, that anyone would be willing to give to God. God is providing, has provided something you can and will be able to give to God to be part of his promise and his purpose and his glory and his honor. You have something you can give even today. God has provided it. He has seen you. Second, it's understood in that time a place that child sacrifice was a thing, a real thing. It was happened in, in different places around that time in that area, in different traditions. And as the history of this story grows in weight, scholars report that child sacrifice lessens and animal sacrifice increases because God got involved. God made it happen. God saw the atrocities and provided it. 
This story became famous and infamous and was passed down through this one person, this one story, this one instance, like yeast through bread spreads. It's an awful story. And yet God seemed to be attending to the violence against children, to the atrocities, and began to protect them through this story. God saw and God provided. So wonder. Would you, would you wonder in your own life, in the lives of others, and in our communities when, when things just look, really look bad? Begin to wonder, how is God going to use this? How is God going to attend to and provide for others through this? How is God going to use this for God's good in the end. Begin to wonder because God sees and is providing. Last, third. I confess to you that I'm always wary of folks who take a story like this and boil it down to a simple answer. There's just so much history and context and tradition involved that we have to mine these stories over and over to find the lessons. And this time in the reading, I began to wonder, I began to wonder if Isaac was actually ever going to be hurt. And here's why. If Abraham had said no and gone that direction, I could imagine Abraham sacrificing his own life, protecting his child. And as Abraham said yes, the other direction, the heart of God just couldn't bear it because God's own heart cannot betray his love. God couldn't allow such pain. He provided the ram. And God provided the sacrifice that wasn't Abraham's son, but instead God allowed, I say again, God allowed his one and only begotten son, Jesus, to be sacrificed. So Abraham never had to. He sacrifices in ways so we don't have to. God takes our pain and takes our grief and takes our horror. He takes the weight of our sacrifice because our God's love for us will not let us do it alone, not walk it alone, not carry it alone, not lose it alone, not feel it alone, not do it alone. So our God takes it upon God's self to provide us and for us. How many times has God taken it instead of us? God sees our need and our fear. God sees the sacrifices needed and God's love jumps in to help. God sees and God provides. So while with this story we have actually no idea if and how or why God would ever ask Abraham and Isaac to journey up that mountain for the horror. We really only have guesses. What we do know is this. It is God's own son who was killed, showing us again that his love, his want of, of us all, his provision for whatever har awful hard thing, he sees you and there is no length to which he will not go to love us. This story lays claim to me and to you, to our world and to our lives. All that we have and all that we are are God's. And that, my friends, is a terrifying and beautiful thing. This story lays claim that this is God's world and you are God's, but especially in the hard and heart-wrenching, demanding moments of pain and sacrifice, he sees your need, he will provide, and there's no length he will not go to love you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.